and thank you so much for coming along today. This is a, a celebration and a reflection of what's been just over 12 months of work on Breakthrough. Um, I said recently that at a meeting of the partners in, in this project that it's a bit like giving birth. It's, I can barely remember a time before Breakthrough. It <laughs> seems to have been with me forever. Um, <laughs> but, it, but it is just over a year and, and uh, so we're really excited to be um, having this opportunity to talk about it today. We're not going to spend a lot of time on the content, so if that's what you're wanting, you'll have to come along to one of the Breakthrough programs. Um, what we are going to be focusing today on is what we've learnt along the way with this project. <coughs> Thank you. And I'm just going to add a little tiny bit to that. <laughs> um, <laughs> a little tiny bit to that about how pleased I was. I'm really pleased to be here. I'm really pleased that the seats are all full. And I loved the name of this presentation. And you know, when Naomi said, let's talk about what the families have taught us, I just felt in my heart that that was a really good way, a really good lens to use today. You know, and I think of the partnership with an organisation like Turning Point and Shark and I think, and Bouverie Centre, and I think we have a really uh, very diverse kind of paradigms of working that coming together bring a really rich stream of, uh, you know, program and service delivery. And just a little bit on uh, Family Drug Help at Shark, which is, you know, where I am, of course, as the CEO of Shark. And the families uh, actually set up the program of FDH at Shark and have continued to work beside <coughs> us as lived experience. Many of them have gone off and got professional qualifications along that journey. But we really do feel so privileged to have that river of authentic information from our families. So it's an absolutely precious resource and, uh, and I was really pleased to hear us talk about that today. So I'll hand it back to Naomi who will put her um, little thing on and I'll move that way. Okay, sorry about that we're going to be sort of swapping this around a bit but hope you understand. Um, so we'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are standing and we'd like to pay our respects to their elders and, and to the elders of other Aboriginal communities who may be present today. And we also have another acknowledgement today. Which I'm going to do. Um, I just want to acknowledge that today is Overdose Awareness Day and uh, there was a all over the country, all over the world, there is people who come together to acknowledge the impact of overdose on families, uh, friends, community. And it really, uh, its key message is to take away the stigma uh, and isolation that many people feel when they lose a loved one to overdose. And uh, Shark has one of these days every year and we're currently having one. There's a big one at the Parliament House today, but all over the world there is that. So I just want to acknowledge anybody here today, and, and I'm somebody who's experienced that too, and I know there would be many others who've experienced the loss of a loved one. Um, I just want to acknowledge that um, it is a special day for that kind of reflection today as well. Thank you. And finally, in terms of acknowledgements, we'd like to acknowledge all the people who have worked on this project uh, with us thus far. I'm sure there'll be many more. The list will be tw two or three times as long by the time the project finishes in another three years. Uh, apologies if I've <laughs> forgotten anyone from this list, but I think I've, I've included uh, everybody. So thank you so much. Um, Heather and I are sort of a bit fraudulent uh, standing here because we are just rep representing uh, our, our um, colleagues who uh, many of whom have done a lot of the groundwork on this, putting the program together, uh, going out and presenting the breakthrough program to families and coming back to Heather and I and telling us what they have learned in this program. So we're just the messengers, messengers really. 
So, and we'd of course like to thank all the families that have come along to the Breakthrough Program, and I'll tell you how many that is in a little while, it's quite a number. Um, and uh, uh, we'd also like to acknowledge all the families out there at the moment who are struggling with uh, a loved one with uh, either ice or other types of addiction. So a little bit about Breakthrough. Breakthrough is an education program. Uh, it is four hours of education, roughly. Uh, we either present Breakthrough as, a one, as one four hour session or as two two hour <coughs> sessions. And all that is totally arbitrary. It could have been uh, a four year program. Uh, it could have been a four minute program. So, uh, you know, the four hours came about as what, what sort of the um, optimal amount of time that we can have with uh, family members where we're able to provide them with some useful information that they can uh, actually go away and use where it can be of benefit for them, but where we're also not asking people to uh, take too much time out of their life in order to participate. The program has been delivered across Victoria and, and uh, I know Rob Campbell out, out there from Shark has promised me that one day he's going to produce a map of Victoria with little sort of um, uh, spots in it showing all the areas that we've been to. So next time we present, we'll have, we'll have such a map. Uh, the program's been delivered, uh, funded by the Department of Health and Human Services. It's part of the uh, ICE Action Plan and it's a joint project between Turning Point, Shark and the Breweries Centre. So I would like to uh, especially thank the Breweries Centre for their input to the project. They've been really helpful in looking over the materials and making comments and suggestions about the work that we're doing. As I said, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the content today, that's not the main focus, but just to let people know what we do when we run a breakthrough session. So we've divided the program into three uh, topics or areas. So we start off by talking about the facts about ice and about drug use in general. We then provide the families with strategies, um, things that they can do, posit you know, positive strategies that they can do to both help themselves and also to help their loved ones who um, are dealing with problems of, of ice addiction. <coughs> and also uh, we talk about where people can go to get further help because really the four hours that we spend with the families in the Breakthrough Program is really just the beginning of the journey. Um, and so the most important thing I think we can do is emphasise that there is help out there, that there are people who are available to listen and to provide um, uh, ongoing help for the families and where they need to go to access that help. So there are a number of objectives to the program. Um, the the uh, Breakthrough Program was an, uh, set up as an education program for families and community members. Um, so it was most important that, that it be aimed at families where somebody in the family uh, has a nice problem. Um, and it, it was very important to us that we were providing practical strategies. So it wasn't just about giving information. We really, it is really important that we're empowering people. And I guess I've, I've sort of emphasised, I think, the main points of, of what we're trying to do, uh, which is skills, providing skills and confidence. So we could call that self-efficacy. So we're trying to enhance self-efficacy amongst the participants, that we're increasing their knowledge, and knowledge is power, uh, as we all know, and we're also increasing their understanding. And so there is obviously quite a difference between knowledge and understanding. So um, rather than just providing information to, p to people that they could read online or in a, on a piece of paper. Uh, we're actually you know, spending time with the families to make sure that they understand what it is, what about that information and that we, ca we have the ability to then uh, answer any questions or concerns that they might have and, and, uh, s and uh, en enhance <coughs> their knowledge in certain areas. We start off the program with a quiz. Um, and so part of the, you know, the, the quiz is partly about um, building a rapport with the audience and, and uh, sort of setting the scene for what's mm -hmm. to come. But we, it's also an opportunity for us to do a bit of myth busting. So I know that um, I'm talking to a very um, knowledgeable audience here 
Uh, so all of you would know that the answer to that question um, is B, alcohol. But of course that wouldn't be true for a lot of the families that we're um, speaking to because uh, when you look at the uh, emphasis in the media on ice and, and um, uh, other types of drugs, you would you know, forget that in fact alcohol is still um, the uh, drug that, that causes most concern in the community. So we do a bit of myth busting, we provide them with some information about um, the ambulance call outs for the, you know, the, uh, in the last year and how the majority of those have involved alcohol not ice and sort of do you know put things in perspective I guess to some extent. So we have a bit of a discussion um, sort of around the issue is there in fact an ice epidemic everyone's talking about ice epidemic what does that in fact mean um, and we clarify some of the issues around that. We have a discussion with families about things like the ice effects on the brain uh, so we try and make it simplified and uh, easily understood by everyone but I guess really trying to um, help people understand the behaviour that they're seeing when they, when they see their loved ones behaving uh, in a way that, that they know is not normal and, and, and uh, is um, problematic for them um, to try and give an, an explanation for that behaviour. So I guess why the need you know um, and it's interesting, in the drug and alcohol and mental health sector, we've had relatively minimal focus on families. We have trends that follow some kind of high political, high media, uh, uh, you know, highlights. But generally, the uh, support to families and the focus on families has been minimal, in my view. So, but what we do know is that for every drug dependent or person experiencing uh, drug misuse, problematic drug misuse, whatever term we want to use there, there's up to five family members that could be potentially impacted. And uh, Orford in 1990 continues to say that it also could be another 12 members in, in the community. So very clearly we know, the research tells us, that the impact is not just the person with the uh, drug drug issue. And we also know that uh, uh, increased stress and psychological impacts results in an increase in the uptake on health <laughs> services by up to 25%. So a really significant uh, issue in our community. Um, you know, and I think, you know, I, be, I may be a little controversial here, but I think that in the past we've seen the role of families as predominantly to uh, fix or support the person with the initial problem uh, and very much treatment services have been focused with that lens and what we've seen thankfully in the last few years of service system structure is an acknowledgement that uh, family members in their own right have a significant impact from the trauma of living with a, or supporting a loved one with uh, addiction disorder or substance misuse problems. So we really know that and we speak publicly about it now, which is a really good thing. Um, uh, so yes, they're also in a position to be uh, helpful to the, to the uh, person with the uh, primary problem, that's for sure. But we also know that in their own right and in the rest of their family space, they need the support and, uh, you know, uh, kind of care that uh, is going to help them not only keep themselves more healthy, but keep their whole family unit more he healthy, which ultimately is a better outcome for the person with the substance use disorder. So, you know, I think it's really um, a very lovely change that I've seen in mental health and drug and alcohol. Um, and one I'll be doing a lot more work on seeing change um, furthering in that way. Um, I guess in the uh, breakthrough program we talk about the stages of change and many of you have seen this in the Procrafter and De Clementi kind of model about how people uh, make change. So this is just an example that's been modified somewhat to talk about the changes that a family goes through as their 
uh, supporting or not supporting, whatever the case may be, a loved one. And uh, you can see the kind of not yet stage. I can't talk to my loved one about her drug use. It's all too hard. So that would be the kind of pre-contemplation that we know in the typical model for the service user. Um, I really love my partner, but I want him to address his problems. So maybe, maybe not. That kind of, you know, I love that person, but, you know, I'm in that stage where I can't totally commit to what I need to do. Then very often we get, I need to change the way I communicate with my daughter. Um, I'm going to speak to a counsellor or a peer worker or somebody who's got some experience that could shed some light on the way that I might go about this conversation. You know, I have some new ideas about how I can do things differently. And then, you know, we always have the, the part of the continuum that talks about a slip. And I guess that just acknowledges that nothing in life is linear and prescriptive and perfect. And people come in and out of uh, the, sp the space of change. Um, sometimes uh, we don't necessarily see a bit of a slip. Some families actually find a rhythm and a, uh, a way through this cycle and they don't all come in at the same stage and not everybody goes through the same uh, key components. So it, it's a model only. But uh, you know, some, some families, and I'm privileged to work with many, uh, have a very um, clear view of their position in this process with their loved one. Um, the other thing is that, uh, um, you know, <laughs> again, models are only models and sometimes people may go in and out of that many times. But it just helps, I think, families, and this was put together with, with family consultation, that um, it's not, there is no one prescribed journey to support somebody with a, a loved one with addictive disorder. And that's really hard when the heart's involved. Like it's a head trip when we talk about models. But you know, when it's somebody that you really deeply love, it's very hard to work with an academic framework. We're not quite that um, dehumanised. You know, we, we get caught again in this space. Um, but it's a really good framework to help families understand uh, that process. Um, we talk about um, strategies for families and, uh, you know, I've really got to say that most of this we didn't get out of textbooks. Most of this we got from focus groups of families that gave us the feedback about what worked for them. Um, yes, we did look at lots of evidence. Um, it's always a lovely partnership with Shark and Turning Point because we have a different lens um, and what we get as that hybrid I think is really rich. Um, but certainly a lot of this came from research but much of this came from families themselves about what worked with them. So we go through effective communication and active listening and this isn't rocket science but to to go through it in a reinforced way when you're emotionally uh, um, experiencing some kind of high distress or high emotion can be really helpful. Um, helpful versus unhelpful family roles. And that's really looking at the, um, taking the focus off the individual as being the primary problem and seeing it as a systemic issue, not to use the word problem, where we all adjust to the way um, one member is behaving. So we all pick up and we all play out our roles. So it helps us to look at that whole role uh, process that occurs. Um, setting boundaries, and we're going to go through a couple of examples uh, of that. Uh, dealing with challenging behaviours, and this has been particularly, we've been doing this for years, but for us we've really had to think about what does the use of ice as that's our prime drug, you know, first kind of roll out, the focus that the department asks us to focus on. It has more challenging behaviours associated with an escalating drug. Um, so there's been quite a lot of work that we've done around what could be really helpful there. Uh, Self-care, you know, and that comes back to the, you know, the thing I was talking about, about 
family's well-being and how critical that, that is. We can't just focus on the individual. Um, safety plans and, uh, you know, it's a funny kind of a word, but it's really good for a family to feel that they have a plan if something escalates that, you know, that they can turn to and follow that plan. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But we've been told by families it's very reassuring to know that they have got a safety plan that can work in the reality of their environment. Um, additional family support. And when I'll talk about some of the things that we've learnt from families over the years, we really see Breakthrough is, a, um, I believe, a very good educational package that looks at the holistic needs but it is a front door. For some families, it's enough. For other families, they're really wanting to uh, become part of a continuum of care and support that is going to uh, walk with them in that journey. So we spend a lot of time at the end part of the um, uh, program delivery talking about how that might work in their local areas. Um, these are just some of the examples of boundaries that, and again, these have come from families as examples, which I always find uh, very helpful. Um, you know, I, I, my father died of alcoholism and he was a classic with me and many times he, my birth father, Rob's looking confused, um, but many times, um, you know, we'd get into these kind of conversations. So, you know, um, often my response was, don't ask me to do it again, you know, and uh, I went to a school about more healthy ways to say it and, you know, I've decided not to pay your bail again if you get arrested. So we work through some really practical, helpful ways to address some of the situations that comes up. Um, another example is, um, stop telling me. <laughs> you know, that you've got another excuse for another story and another set of chaos that you're bringing home. A classic, you know, uh, reframing of that. I'd prefer not to hear about the details of what you're up to when you're using. Like that can be a horrific kind of story uh, to hear for family members. Um, not everybody. Some people might like it, but you know, most people would like to have an option with the way that they communicate. Um, uh, the classic, you know, that we get, we run a 24 hour helpline, direct line, do the after hours for us, which is so much appreciated. But uh, we have family members trained as volunteers, some of them here today, which is lovely to see. And, uh, you know, we constantly are told about family members who ring in saying they get calls at all times of the night. And that, that horrible kind of dilemma and complexity of, uh, not shutting your love off to somebody, but finding a way to set some boundaries so that your own life can be, and the rest of your family can have some resemblance of normality. You know, so the classic is, don't you dare ring me at this time of the night. You know, not always. Um, but there again, you get another example. Uh, the dinner at 6 p.m. You know, the, the, the more positive way, I serve dinner at 6 p.m. for those who are at home that time or rather than you have to be home at six o'clock. Some of this kind of ways is, it's not that families are wrong in their way of communicating. Most of them are under extreme distress. Most of them have been under that for a long time. And most of them, in my experience, have been managing it and handling it by themselves. Um, so, you know, uh, totally understandable that conversation gets to that point. And there's just another example, um, I don't want to live in an environment where there is constant conflict. I've started to think about my options is a better way of saying you're the cause of the chaos in my family. Um, so just reframing, uh, picking really simple ways. And you know, one of the, the feedbacks we get that Naomi will talk about in a minute will be some of the helpful things that we've found people have decided was really helpful in the breakthrough training. It, wrong hit. Importance of self-care, and I'm a big one on this, and anybody who knows FDA at uh, Shark knows that. I love um, Naomi's choice of uh, um, <coughs> graphics there, but 
you know, like we can all get to the space where we're just holding too much. You know, and I don't know if anybody else has experienced this here, but I certainly have, you know, where I, my head's just too full and I'm holding too much responsibility and I don't know where I start and the other person starts, you know, and, and so one of the things that we do is work really uh, a lot around self-care and just coming to a still place and then trying to rebuild in a way that uh, more resilience is experienced. Um, some of the key contacts, you know, the, the department have put, have we got anybody from the department here today? It's interesting, isn't it? Um, um, <laughs> busy people, you know. But, the, you know, the, there has been a lot of money um, uh, put out um, through the Department of Human Services for um, the response to ICE. And most of us know that there was high uh, media kind of, uh, you know, carry on about it and there had to be some kind of public response. We have been very lucky to receive really substantial funding in several areas. Um, um, we do have an ICE advice line now, that uh, direct line run. Um, which is 24 hours and uh, it's uh, staffed and manned by p people particularly around the ICE issue. Uh, family Drug Helpline at Shark, which is 24 hours, uh, five days a week is manned by people with lived experience and trained and uh, then the out of hours go to direct line. And uh, direct line of course and uh, counselling online which direct line also, uh, Turning Point also run. There's just a few uh, key contacts there. Uh, bah. I don't even need to, to speak to that one, do I? That's the registrations uh, and how people get, yeah, get into our space. Um, and Naomi's now going to talk about some of the stats for achievement. And um, so I'm just going to rush through this pretty quickly just to let you know um, you know, what, what we've done so far and where, where we're at. Um, so, this is, this, these figures are from uh, the end of the financial year, from the end of uh, June. So, we managed to hit our targets or exceed our targets in the first really less than nine months of running the program. We um, delivered breakthrough to over 1,500 participants. Um, all over Victoria, which was fantastic. Um, so that's where the, the first session, the first pilot session started around October last year. So um, by the end of June, we've, we had delivered 51 sessions and, and we're sort of aiming for around 40 to 50 sessions a year. So it's a lot of work um, for a, few no a small number of people. Uh, and uh, we've, we've balanced those, those uh, sessions in regional and metropolitan areas. So uh, this is what we know about the people who are coming along. <coughs> um, the majority of them are our target audience, so about nearly 80% of them are in fact people who have a family member with a, with a, um, an, a, a, a drug problem specifically um, using ice. As a, a smaller percentage are people who are either just interested in the program or um, might be concerned about uh, a related problem or, a, or a, perhaps a potential problem. The majority of people attending the program are female. Um, I won't make any more of a comment about that. Uh, the age group, I think, was a little bit surprising <coughs> for me anyway. It may not have be surprising for people in the room, but approximately 50% of people attending Breakthrough are over the age of 50. So I might have expected a slightly younger audience and we could speculate on, on what the reason for that might be. We, we've discovered that there are an awful lot of um, people out there with adult children with, uh, who are using ICE, many of whom are looking after grandchildren uh, or other family members. and. Um, um, that's, you know, a, a, a group that we really need to be looking after. The, the majority of, of uh, people who um, are the ICE users that these families are representing are male, but a significant proportion are female as well. 
And the age group of people using ice is also quite interesting um, because it, this, I think this, this uh, diagram really shows that people of all ages are using ice. Uh, certainly the, the largest group there, the 41% the is the, in the 20, 21 to 29 age group. But we, we can see that there are people of all ages um, who are users. Um, and th this is also interesting, the um, length of time that people have been dealing with it, the issue in the family. It, it's both interesting and one of the challenges that we have in running this program. So we have people coming along to Breakthrough who are maybe um, uh, have a family member who has really just started um, uh, using ice and, and um, uh, some of the issues involved at, at that stage might be quite different from some families who are coming along where they have had somebody in the family who has been uh, using this drug for quite a period of time um, and had quite profound impacts from using the drug. I think most of the time we're able to use that uh, diversity in the group um, as an advantage because obviously the family members are able to help one another and talk to one another um, a little bit about their experiences. The good news um, from our point of view about whether or not we're doing our job um, is that the majority of people are satisfied with the, the uh, program that we're presenting to them. And perhaps even more importantly, the vast majority of people say at the end of the program that they're likely to follow through on some of the suggestions that have been made during the program. So we're reasonably positive that we're able to get across ideas and strategies to families that they are then able to take on board. I talked before about self-efficacy. Again, the majority of people feel that after they feel that after they've attended that program they feel more positive about the likelihood that they are actually able to do something to help family members. And finally, 99%, which you can't do much better than that, let's face it, um, of people who attend uh, say that they would recommend the program to people with a similar problem. So we'll move on now to some of the things that we've learned and I'd like to sort of thank um, my team of facilitators for giving me some of their learnings and, and I know that virtually every day after we run a breakthrough session um, the, the facilitators arrive in at work and they're, they're sort of huddled around and I know some of the time they're talking about what they watched on television and other things that, <laughs> um, that they do with their lives. But um, a lot of the time they're, they're discussing with one another uh, what happened in the breakthrough session, um, what came out of that session, some of the things that they learnt, some of the difficulties that they might have had to struggle with in that session. So there's a lot of debriefing that happens the next day. And uh, these are just some of the things that I've pulled out um, for us to think about. Uh, many of these won't surprise you, but then if they did surprise you, I'd be worried um, that we were looking at the wrong things. So we've learned that there's a great need for uh, the families to get together to share their stories and experiences with one another, and that the uh, opportunity to do that is a great relief for a lot of families. We've learned that families are desperate for services and I think the, the key word in, in this next line is quickly. They're looking for quick fixes. Um, I mentioned that the program is four hours long. I think there are, there are a percentage of people who think that they're going to come along to a four hour education workshop and by the end of it they're going to have the solution to their problems. Um, and it's perhaps disheartening for a lot of people to realise that it's not that simple. Uh, but they certainly are very grateful for the information that is provided. One of the quotes that uh, we have from a family are people saying, we shouldn't be ashamed about this. We should be supporting each, others, uh, with each other and letting others know that we need their support too. So we know that there's a lot of shame and stigma in families where somebody in the family has a drug problem. And uh, the... the uh, group program is an opportunity for people to 
to talk about that and to recognise the fact that there is no shame in having uh, a family member with this problem, that there is a great need for support and there's a need for families to support each other and also for families to speak to other people and get support from other people in the community as well. And one of the stories that, uh, that uh, one of our facilitators told me, which I think is a, is a lovely story, when we run the session over two weeks, we usually say to people, because as you can imagine, there's limited amount of time for people to um, uh, talk about their own experiences during the program. So we, we give people the phone numbers that Heather mentioned earlier. And we say, you know, if you really want to speak to somebody, these are the numbers that you could call. And one of the people who came along to one of the sessions rang uh, direct line in between the two sessions and she came back to the session and said that she spent over an hour and a half on the phone with someone from direct line, um, that it was really helpful. She was struggling with her son. Uh, she, told the, uh, she told the other members of the group that calling direct line had been really helpful and, and um, what she had gotten out of that experience. And it was, that was a really powerful message for the rest of the group to know that if they call this number, there's going to be somebody at the end of the line who um, is happy to talk to them and is going to be helpful. We have certainly learnt that <coughs> regional participants have particular issues and struggles that they have to deal with um, and that there's a frustration out there in regional Victoria that many of us who live in metropolitan areas with what we consider to be a, a dearth of services but is sort of nothing <laughs> compared to the situation um, out in the region, um, uh, don't have to deal with it in most cases. We have also learnt that despite the fact that there are wonderful organisations like FDH out there to help families, a lot of families don't know that there are um, organisations and people out there prepared to help. Mm -hmm. They feel very alone, they feel very isolated um, and they feel like they're the only ones that are going through that problem. And so I think getting together with other families who are, who are facing similar problems is, is beneficial in and of itself regardless of what we say or do on top of that. We have learnt that there's a lot of shame and stigma associated to having a family member who's a substance user and that really from an educational point of view and, and my focus is on drug and alcohol education and education to people who work in the drug and alcohol sector uh, is that there's really a lot of work that still needs to be done in reducing the shame and stigma attached um, to these problems, not only for the people who um, are using drugs themselves, but also for their families and loved ones. And the last thing I'd like to, to mention, this is a, a sort of a positive note, I think, and, and something that's really important for us all to remember, is that people never give up on their loved ones. So we've had people attending Breakthrough who have been to hell and back, let's face it, um, who are still coming along, who still recognise that, that they have things to learn and are still wanting to help and haven't given up um, on their family members. And there's something, you know, sort of a really powerful message about that for everybody, I think. Um, and a couple of things from the facilitators uh, at Shark, and like I said, many of them are family members themselves. Um, uh, some of them very similar to what TP's facilitators brought back the healing power of people coming together with similar experiences. And uh, anybody who's been an advocate around the peer support kind of framework, you know, understands the critical success factors in that type of mutuality and connection. We know it's incredibly powerful. Um, we also have learned that many families have developed great skills in response to their loved one's use. And we need to listen. We need to not only listen when we put curriculum together for particular cohorts, but we need to be constantly having conversations and listening to people, is this still working for you? And I, you know, I think we have some real challenges in how to do that in an authentic, meaningful way, but we're certainly giving it a good go. Um, uh, and for many people, there needs to be a continuum of support post the kind of front end uh, breakthrough information dissemination. 
Yes. And there is some really growing streams of uh, what I would say is great support. And traditionally, we saw it in just pockets of services like Shark, but there is funding now for families in other uh, organisations, and I absolutely applaud it. So, you know, more and more that families can come and get, uh, or community can come and get information through something like Breakthrough, and that may be perfectly adequate. But there are other families who have ongoing issues who need to have that continuum of support. So a critical part of Breakthrough's objective is to make sure that we uh, help people know where they are and if need be afterwards help them navigate it. Um, uh, this is an interesting one, you know, the whole of the family, family system. So again, it's reinforced what, by what I said before about the change of lens, that we're moving the lens from just the individual person with the problem to the systemic impact on the whole of the family. Um, and really that, that's, that quote actually came from a family member there. Um, the other thing we've learned is families are really different and you can't c prescribe one particular response or series of uh, events that we put up as a uh, intervention for families. Families are really different just as everybody else is and, uh, and when we're thinking about support responses post-education we really need to consider that. Um, and I love this one, you know, that love doesn't always play by rules. You know, so we can set up frameworks that make sense. We can get empirical evidence that supports it. We can get lived experience that supports it. But sometimes in some situations, love takes us in another direction. Kind of part of the beauty of the human soul, but it's also one of the challenges as uh, a group of people who are trying to uh, put together a package of response. Um, and again, there's sometimes academic understanding and knowledge of best practical responses can be incredibly challenging to put into practice. And both those quotes come from families, by the way. Um, uh, I, I, this one's a beautiful one, that often the whole family unit experiences change and growth. And as one family member put it so beautifully, we try to move towards wellness as a family unit rather than away from the chaos of addiction, you know. And that doesn't mean that that was arrived at quickly or that that's a permanent static spot that they sit, but that that view can have come into their space at some point through this process of breakthrough, I think it's a very positive indicator. Um, ah, your turn. It's all right. So we just thought that, uh, you know, we've got 10 minutes left and I just look around the room and I see heaps of expertise um, and heaps of people that have had different uh, experiences in the journey, whether it be professional, whether it be a family member, whether it be a hybrid of both. Um, and just wondering about, is there any audience I guess questions to us, but probably more importantly, anything that you'd like, any information that you'd like to give us uh, or considerations that we might take on board as we move through this. This is a four year package of education delivery. So as we go along, we're going to change possibly the trend of the particular drug, but we want to know that, you know, if that's what uh, we're seeing in, in the data, but we want to make sure that we take on board the very best um, and the most of what people have to bring us.